three. It says it's getting ready. Okay, it looks like we are up and live. Welcome everyone. Hello. For those of you who haven't joined us before, my name is Georgie. I'm from Procreate Social Media Team and we are so excited to be here with Ian today who's going to be doing a live draw for us. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, so everyone in the chat here, if you have any questions at any time, you can ask them in the chat box. Our lovely friend Lol is on the other end. She's gonna be answering any questions that you have or passing them on to me to talk to Ian about. Um, you can also find, if you wanna have a look, Ian's brushes and courses are linked in the caption for this video. So you can go and purchase them there if you'd like and you can find more of his art on his Instagram. But I'll hand over to you, Ian. Maybe you could introduce yourself to our audience for a little bit. Hey everyone. It's such an honor to be here. I am Ayan and I'm from India. I was staying in Bangalore, but I had to come back. So I'm, right now I'm in my hometown. It's Chalpaiguri. It's a small town, uh, North Bengal. And I've been working in the industry for close to a decade now, uh, almost like nine years, nine plus years, I guess. And I've been, uh, I, I have worked in uh, concept arts, uh, concept art world. I have worked in some games, AAA games, and some indie games here and there. And I have done a whole lot of illustrations uh, throughout my journey. So, and uh, again, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm like, excited to create something today. So excited to see what you paint. <laughs> it's exciting to see your process as well. I've only ever seen like uh, the finished pieces or our progress pieces from our commissions together, but to actually see you paint live is going to be so exciting. Yeah, uh, let's hope I can pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can. Uh, I'll just get started. So usually what I do is for these sort of sketches, I'll usually divide my canvases so they're like smaller. So I'm planning to do like two sketches or maybe like I'll start with like two ideation processes and then eventually switch to one, whichever I like. And generally I'll divide my screen like this. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four. Sometimes I'll start with like 16 thumbnails altogether. And then I just start like, if I have no idea, no clear motive where to go, I'll generally just start doing random stuff with the brushes and try to find something. But uh, when I have some idea, even then I'll do that to find better comps, better shapes and better style structures overall. So let's see what happens. <laughs> and you said that you like, you explore a lot when you're beginning there. Do you have a color palette in mind when you begin as well, Ayan, or do you just kind of go for it and see what colors come to mind? So usually uh, when I'm just, when I just don't have any idea what I'm doing, I'm just trying to create uh, new ideas. Then I'll just throw in random colors and random brushes in there and then try to find a comp in them. Otherwise, uh, when I'm doing a plan piece, I'll have some sort of idea uh, that this is what I want to do. And this is, this color scheme should look good. So I always have something back in my mind going on and I'm always thinking about these things, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. And do you have any formal education or are you all self-taught? Because your uh, artwork is just the composition, the colors, it's also on point all the time. I'm self-taught. I did attend um, uh, this thing, animation college, but they only taught 3D and I was not really interested in 3D back then all that much. Yeah. And specifically, they are mostly teaching just, uh, you know, just the um, uh, animation uh, <laughs> and modeling and all that. So, yeah, not really my thing. So I sort of moved on, didn't really pay attention there. And yeah, I just kept roaming around the town and walk like 15, 20 kilometers a day so just to like, you know, uh, exploring new places, going into jungles, chasing after like 
animals and all that, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, after I got out of college, I sort of uh, started doing, you know, uh, starting being more serious about it. You know, uh, like I need to do something with my life. I need to figure out like if this is a valid thing that I can do uh, to support myself. And mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, I just kept practicing, practicing, and most of this, most of the stuff I've learned, I've learned from internet, and not even paid courses. It's just like everything is free out there. You don't need to pay. But like right now, what I'm seeing, a lot of like you know, Gumroad tutorials, like you know, a lot of courses and everything. Everything is a lot more structured and a lot easier to find. So, uh, like, yeah, learning nowadays is really easy. like it's really easy, I would say. But like, uh, still need to commit. And, yeah. But back then, like, we did not have that. Uh, I was just like, you know, stumbling my way through here and there, like finding out new stuff. And yeah, <laughs> I guess yeah. Now, I can paint a bit. So. And was it always art that kind of drew you for a career, Ian? Is that something that you always wanted to do? Or was there something else that you thought you might end up doing and then you kind of turned back to art? Uh, so uh, I'll be very honest. Like uh, when I got out of school, I had no idea what I was going to do. I always liked drawing. I, I used to copy stuff from, you know, uh, Pokemon cards and, and like, all those like anime stuff and all those. <laughs> And eventually, um, yeah, like uh, uh, even even when going into college, I was just okay. I'll be getting a laptop. I'll probably be gaming a lot. And that sounds like fun. So let's do it. Uh, so I know that's not a good motive, but yeah, my parents, if they could hear me right now, they'd probably beat me or something, like throw stuff at me. <laughs> But yeah, that that was the initial motivation. But like that's the thing, I, I was very young. I did not did not know how the world worked, and I did not know like what to do with my life. But eventually, yeah, I like I, I took an interest in this, and I I was uh, I was getting more and more into it. And over the years, I just like you know kept studying more and thought, okay, this is this is fun. Let's do this. So yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, we've got a question in the chat, which is, what was your first career breakthrough? Hmm. So I did not really have a single breakthrough per se, but like if I had to mention one, that would be like working with you guys, Procreate. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was really fun, like because that was the first time I realized that, no, before it's like, uh, even before that I was doing sketches and like really do sketches all the time. But uh, I did not really get hired for that all that much. So I did not have really have that confidence in me that, okay, this is something that is actually marketable and that has a, yeah. like, you know, uh, like uh, need in the market. So like after uh, working with you guys, I started exploring more into that field and eventually like, you know, gotten into this sort of stuff, like more stylized, more impressionistic stuff, more and more. Uh, so mm. that 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 was probably one of those, and then like when around like five six years back when I actually moved to Bangalore, I <clears throat> sort of before that I sort of had a job like uh, uh, where I got some amount of decent money out of it, and uh, before that I was doing like really cheap jobs like you know five dollar ten dollar all those like you know deviant art you know draw me or yeah. draw this draw that those kind of commissions. Uh, but after that sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, like earned something and I was like, okay, uh, that's it. Let's, let's uh, just move out. And because I was still staying in home after my college was done and because I did not want to get into a proper job. And yeah, uh, so I moved there uh, with the fund I had, I moved to Bangalore and that was, life changing as well like i learned so many stuff not just art like about life in general and mm. i think that was a big one as well so yeah lovely it's bangalore creative hub in india i've not been to india it's somewhere that i really really want to go it's not really about the place uh it's rather just you know me uh just staying there because bangalore is still one of the costliest city in uh india mm. So I was like, okay, if I can't 
uh, afford to stay here, I should be looking for something else to do. So I, I just okay. I just had like that limited fund and I uh, so I just like went there and yeah uh, let's 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 see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> leap of faith of sorts. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> So what are you doing here on the canvas right now? You've sorry, the stream will be a little bit delayed from where our conversation is, Ian. But hmm. um, you've so you've done two different drawings on the one canvas. Hmm. So here I still have a like not clear, but I have some idea in my mind that I want to achieve. One is sort of a uh, sunset or sunrise. Sunrise would be a bit cooler in color. But yeah, one would be a sunset or sunrise. I have not decided that yet. Uh, later, like the bottom one would be a bit more cloudy, maybe a mountain scene or something along the line. I'm still figuring out what colors to use and how to plan the composition. So at this stage, you can see I just have a like, single layer. I, like, also, I, uh, I know, I, I'm not sure if you guys have seen that. I did the plain air challenge and that has like forced me a lot to you know just think quickly and don't worry about the layers all that much so I'm, nowadays i'm just like doing everything with like two three layers at the most and yeah that's two or three that's, layers at the most yeah <laughs> most <Wow. of> <laughs> because like uh it does not really work in a professional environment because you need to change a lot of stuff when you're yeah. just you know uh like making changes then having layers is a nice thing but uh, when you're just sketching out ideas, I don't think all those you know, layers are necessary. You can just change it around very quickly with like single brush strokes. So, yeah. Okay. We've got a question in the chat from Nayanika Sengupta who asks, mm. what are your color palettes inspired by? Mm. So they are generally inspired a lot from uh, nature in general, and but not particularly what you see in nature. Because I do a lot of studies here and there, like even when I'm not doing studies, I will probably be just observing in general. So when I go see a cloud that looks really interesting, I try to find out like, why why does it look so interesting? What is like, uh, you know, uh, so I, I ponder a lot whenever I just like sitting in the roof or just taking a walk. I'm just like, you know, watch everything, stare at everything I'm like a crazy person. And from those, like I sort of get this idea that, okay, this could work here, this could work here. So I have a visual library now that I can mm -hmm. use whenever I'm painting something. And uh yeah so that's how like color uh, and when planning colors in general i try to initially start with complementary set like here you can see it's yellow and blue here i have not decided yet so i'm not still sure but it's still uh analogous color where like all the colors are in the like similar spectrum so uh yeah, these sort of things like eventually i initially i don't expect anyone to think about all this when they're painting but as you move along, it becomes easier. So that's when you should be like, you, you don't even need to force yourself. It just comes to you naturally if you practice enough. Uh, you should be able to think of these things on the fly and yeah, hopefully create something in the process. So. Oh, it's a really nice comment here from Ritish Pillai. He says, I met Ayan at a Comic-Con a few years back in Mumbai. And I was highly inspired by him. I have been following his work ever since. I'm a hobbyist artist myself and hope to do this full time someday. Oh yeah, the Comic Con days. That takes me back. I, I used to do a lot of uh, conventions because yeah, that was uh, like the only way I could support myself because freelance is like uh, it's it's not very uh, risk free. Like most of the time, we'd be sitting idle. Like even. Uh, like most of my career back, like at least uh, before like two years back, I, I, I was idle. I'd be working maybe two, three months a year. And rest of the time yeah. I have to figure out like how to, you know, how to do this. Because I always, always hated the idea of having a proper job, like, you know, dressing up nicely and, you know, doing what people say. 
<laughs> I, I don't know. That's I mean that's how most jobs are in India, and I right. had experienced that really early on, and uh, I I did not like that idea, so I just moved along, and I say okay, I'll just freelance. Doesn't matter like if I starve or not. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so comic cons I used to uh, go to those, make some profits maybe hopefully, and then uh, maybe you know uh, like survive on that for next few months. But it was so much fun. Like I got to meet so many people, so many nice people. Like you know, comes and you get to talk to so many people in conventions. That's such a like nice yeah. thing. Yeah. I usually don't do that very much. Like <laughs> I just stay inside or just even if I'm going outside, <laughs> I'll be probably finding a place where no one else is, and yeah. yeah, just sitting there looking at random stuff. So it was a nice change of pace. Definitely. Are there lots of conventions and things around India? Uh I guess so, but like nowadays they are not really worth it for the artists because they have started devaluing the artists more and and they have gotten into more you know merchandising and all that, mm. and it's also very costly. It's not cheap like if you compare it to other things. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I don't I don't know like lots of conventions, but I'm not sure like if they are <laughs> like worth it for the artists. Yeah. Conventions can be really costly. I know that was a big discourse around uh, American conventions in 2019. It's like, they're so good for meeting people. It's so exciting to go and see your favorite artists or meet new artists. But mm. I think tabling can be really expensive. It can be really hard to make the money back that yeah. you've spent on actually being there. Exactly, exactly. Well, we've got a few questions coming in now. Where have we got another one? Ah, someone has said, uh, which do you prefer, basic Procreate brushes or customized ones? I believe you use almost exclusively your own brushes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all my own brushes. Even if I have some basic brushes in here, like the airbrush and all that, I generally try to modify them so they suit me more. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I like basic brushes are fine, but... I generally like to play around with brushes and trying to come up with like new textures all the time. So it's fun for me and it works out as well. So, yes. Brushes are always so exciting to play with. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I think LOL might have recently downloaded your brushes as well. I had, we had a play with them the other day. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> she did. They were super fun. Uh, so are you enjoying them a lot? Or <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. It's always such an exciting time to download new brushes from people and try them. It's like, <laughs> yeah, kind of get a little insight into that artist as well, I feel. It's really cool. Yeah, I generally like the idea of chaos a lot. So I generally try to you know, implement chaos as much as possible in my artwork and yeah. try to find some sort of order in them. And even now, I'm just like trying to lay down shapes. Not sure where this is going, but hopefully this is going somewhere. <laughs> So yeah, most of my brushes are like that. I mean, at least they, some of these are. So just they generate random shapes and play around with them. And yeah, okay, that's, that's just happening. Oh, another really lovely comment. I'm not financially able to study art, but when you said you're self-taught, now I have some hope for a good art career. Oh, you can do it, Ravi. You can totally do it. Yep. You need uh, like a whole lot of money to, you know, just, you just need to support yourself and buy your time for a while, while you uh, put the time in. And after that, it's mm. just like, you know, about how hard you work, I guess. Because Absolutely. I've been mostly, most of my life, I've been pretty lazy myself, but last couple of years, <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's a very, like, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, very true stuff, like, uh, very lazy. Like if I just take my attention away from myself a bit, my mind will start wandering off and it's like, okay, let's rest a bit. Mm. But yeah. I had a question from Procreate HQ for you, actually. I oh. believe this one was in from Tom. Um, okay. Do you work from photo reference, observation, imagination, or a combination of all of the above? 
Mm, I'd say all of the above, but like most of the time when I sketch uh, ideas, I generally try not to take any references because yeah. they tend to uh, like influence my design, shape, language, and colors a lot. So yeah. when I'm doing the sketches, I'll generally start without much reference. If I'm working on a like uh, project that needs to be just uh, you know just there, like you need to nail it right from the get-go, then I'll have references. But otherwise, I just start out sketching like this, whatever comes to my mind. And when I see, okay, this is this is a subject that I want to paint, and this is the whole comp. Uh, so then I'll be uh, looking for references. Okay, where because. What, how, how that helps me is uh, when I'm thinking of something, it's not exactly accurate. Like uh, it's always, there always will be some sort of discrepancies in my, you know, memory. So whatever, whatever visual library I have, it's, it's colored in my own opinion. So I, I, mm. I get that, uh, I, I get to show my own perspective in that. And then when I take reference, I try to compare it with uh, uh, like how, what I've missed, let's say like this house, like I'm trying to draw a house here, I suppose, but this house may not be accurate. Like it looks like a house, but it's not designed, like that design is not right or something is off. Mm. Maybe the lighting is off or something. So for those, I'll generally take reference afterwards. And yeah, that has helped me like, you know, keep ideas fresh and, you know, come up with new ideas that does not look like a photo. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Logan, the stream will definitely be saved later for all of the people who can't tune in today. Um, it'll be re-uploaded later, probably next month. Oh, Karat has a really good question, and I'm actually interested in this one too. Uh, if Procreate was to bring in more tools, Ian, which one would you want them to bring in? Uh, okay, so I, I tend to, since I always start with colors, I always tend to check values a lot. How I do that is, why did I paint it here? Come on, just give me a moment here. Go back, go back. Okay, so how I check values is I'll generally create a new layer, desaturate the color I have selected or just get it black or whatever, fill the layer and then set it to color. So that way I can still see the values here and uh, it helps me keep the value structure intact even when I'm painting in color. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to have a feature that just uh, I can I don't have to do that I just can like you know use the quick menu or something to just turn those on and off. That would be actually really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a notification. Sorry, everyone who's on the stream. I have just had a notification from our Zoom call telling me that it's going to end in 10 minutes, which is really helpful. Um, so I'm just going to see what I can do about that. Excuse me for the silence. Please enjoy Anne's painting while I do this.
it doesn't look like I can do much without um, the team because we are on a weekend and the team is obviously not working. Perfect. So we might just have to rejoin another Zoom call in a minute, Ian, when it's yeah, um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Run out. You can just yeah, mail cool. me the link. I'll just join in. Yeah, sweet. All right, let's continue, everyone. <laughs> or you, yeah, yeah, you can just mail me. That's fine. <laughs> I'll just ping it. That's okay. okay. Uh, so, Dev, there is uh, a couple tutorials that we have on creating brushes. So we've got uh, some walkthroughs of the Brush Studio on our IGTV channel at Procreate on Instagram, and there's also some walkthroughs on YouTube. Uh, you might be able to find some simple brush creation tutorials as well in our Instagram stories and IGTV channel as well. So check those out. Okay, another question from the chat iron. We've got one from Aqua here. They say, have you got any advice for aspiring artists from India? Uh, <clears throat> it's very generalized, like it's uh, so, but if you're just starting out, I always like, I, I know people are gonna you know, be mad at me because every time they ask, I just keep telling them the same thing over and over again. So just work on your fundamentals, improve your fundamentals because uh, people tend to tunnel vision a lot what, from what I've mm. seen that this is a huge industry like there's a lot of things you can do there's a lot of scopes a lot of different stuff you are able to do that uh, you won't be finding anywhere else so having a good grasp of fundamentals will give you that freedom to choose what you want to do and because like concept art is like uh, there's concept art for games there's concept art for movies but those are like uh, different while gaming uh, like uh, concept art in games will have a lot of uh, like there's a there's room for stylized works there a lot of the games have their own styles and you should be able to uh, like uh, get into those if you're just following a style guide or even if you have your own style that's fine because that, that has been the case with me since I have a like uh, different sort of style that does not meet industry requirement most of the time. So I will not be working in uh, many you know popular IPs all the time or something like that or may not maybe like uh, not frequent jobs there as well. But uh, when you go into movies, you don't have that much scope. Even in games, I still work for games once in a while now and then. But movies required a lot more uh, realistic approach. So, uh, and then when you go into design purely, that's that's even more confusing because, not confusing, but that's more specialized. So you need to learn how to design properly. You need to think about functionalities. You need to think about how stuff works and all that. Concept art generally has a mix of all these, like illustration and uh, designing part. Uh, but yeah, these are the decisions you need to make for yourselves. And to be able to do that, you need to have a solid cost for fundamentals. And yeah, I think like if you just keep uh, improving your fundamentals and painting what you like, or not even what you like, you just keep practicing, you'll find something that you really like doing. And I always suggest sticking to those because if you don't enjoy your work, you will not be producing good quality works. So yeah, practice your fundamentals. Uh, don't slack off on it. And once you find something, just put it, put your everything into it. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Fundamentals are so important. So uh, yeah, you can build on fundamentals, but you can't build on anything if you don't have that base. Yeah, exactly. Another question here. Someone would like to know who are some artists who inspire you? Hmm. So I like a lot of the old impressionist masters like Van Gogh, Monet, and all that. Uh, but living artists, Pascal Campion is there, Boro is there, uh, Sparth is there. I really like unique styles and uh, uh, like I, I like seeing how they achieve something that. Uh, looks very really different yet believable and looks so interesting as well so yeah these are some of the names that's that's just coming to mind 
mind. I also like Sergei Kolsov. I'm not sure like you guys know him. He's also known as Felling. He used to be really active back when I started. He used to do a lot of live streams and I used to just go and watch. So learned a lot from there as well. Oh, sorry, my mute was on. That was <laughs> <laughs> I, was turned, I turned my mute on to take a drink and then I came back and nothing was happening. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> my question was that you mentioned that uh, they did a lot of live streams and stuff. Mm. Um, is live streaming something that you do a lot of outside of this one that we're doing here now? So I actually started doing uh, a few live streams like couple of times a month or something like that when I still was in my studio but uh, since I came home after that I don't really have the setup even the setup I'm working on is very makeshift for this purpose only so it's very hard for me to stream properly without a proper setup and yeah like otherwise I generally try to stream once in a while I hang out with some friends maybe just you know sketch just you know no talking, just silent, you know, streams. So if you're into that, you can actually, you know, if you follow me on Insta or anywhere, I generally try to post them, post about them beforehand. But yeah. Okay, I need to join the call. Just give us a moment here. Mm. It's the same link, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. okay, so I'll just keep painting and let George send me a link to the Zoom call that we can start talking again.
Okay, so I've been asked to talk about what I'm doing since she's trying to figure out how to send a new link. Uh, so, yeah, I think I have a clear idea of which way I want to go with this one. So I'll leave this alone for now. Mm, maybe keep playing with it a bit more. And... So the okay, whatever. We will leave this one alone and maybe go to the next one. So this one maybe has some mountains in the background. Let's try this. Right. In some mountains. So yeah, if you're coming into my stream, this is something that you can expect. I'll be just painting in silently and you can watch and get bored. Check if there's something. Okay. Hello. 
I'll just give you a different ID for Skype so you can change your face. Wait. So yeah, we're still trying to figure this out. Hello, can you hear me? Wait a second. Uh, can you hear me now? Speaker muted. Okay, let's really hope that this Zoom will work. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> oh gosh, that was a nightmare. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for nothing, Zoom. <laughs> well done. Okay, we're back. <laughs> okay, just give me one minute now. Not one minute, five seconds. <laughs> Ah, oh, everyone in the chat back. Awesome. Yes, Carrot, we are also interested to see if we can get some more layers with the new iPad Pro. As soon as we know anything, we will let you guys know as well. Yeah, I'm back. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> what happened while I was gone, guys? What's the goss? Catch me up. So that's that's usually what happens in my streams. I just like paint silently and people get bored and don't come back ever again. 
It's nice and relaxing, I think, as well. Watching people paint is super, super chill. Yeah, there will be some music, though, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wish we could have music. I'm petitioning at work to get at Procreate to get like some custom songs made or something that we can have playing in the background so we don't infringe on anyone's music IP. And you can still play some uh, this thing, no copyright music in the background. Sorry, what was that? Uh, no copyright soundtracks. Yeah. So maybe. Got a message from Lol. We all good? Ah, interesting. Okay. The visual seems to be. Uh, uh, is there an issue? Just wondering if the visual seems to be frozen. Oh yeah. On the For stream. For some reason, air server and close it down and. Hmm. Is it updated now? Might be. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, is your. Oh, it's back? Yeah, it's back. I yeah, okay, just, yeah. cool. Awesome. All right, no, we're all good now, everyone. <laughs> we're all good. Visuals on, audio's on. Excellent. Here we go. <laughs> that's a nice one. Alrighty. Just catching up on the chat. Nice, cool. All right, so it looks like people can. Yep, now it's working. Excellent, sweet. We're all caught up. So usually I just open up the uh, YouTube chat in a secondary window and then maybe try to answer them. But the issue is my laptop is clearly not, you know, able to handle that. I tried that and we were starting, we started doing weird things. So I was like, okay, that's not. Oh God. <laughs> cool. All right. Let me have a look at my questions, which have come through and then we can get back on track. Uh, oh gosh, there are so many. That's excellent. All right. Animesh would like to know, how did you get your first big project in freelancing that changed your life? Mm, I just kept applying at random places and I got the job from somewhere I did not apply. It was maybe something lucky, I guess. But the uh, thing is like, you need to be visible out there as well. I realized that like, you know, more and more as I keep doing my career, so if you are not visible, people are not going to reach out to you. So if you have good online presence, this does not have to be big following. You just need to be posting at separate spaces like, you know, Facebook, Insta, uh, Twitter, ArtStation, whichever. Like the more the merrier, but like don't, too many can be a bit overwhelming. So just try to post uh, everywhere all the time. Not everywhere, but yeah, mostly these spaces like Insta, uh, our station, Facebook, I think are the most important ones. So, mm. as you work, I think we found you through Art Station actually. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah, I think that's where we found you. It, might, it was either Art Station or Instagram. I'm um, not sure. I, I, I had like uh, 300 followers on Insta a few years back, so not sure, maybe. There we go, people. Followers aren't everything. <laughs> <laughs> what else have we got here? Questions. All right, guys. Any questions? Chuck them in the chat. I think Lowell's given me a few to get through. Lots of interest here. Uh, is uh, click through them. Here we go. Someone would like some tips for improving coloring. Uh, study from nature and uh, have mm. a decent understanding of uh, the color theory first. So just don't go out and start putting down random colors. 
because you need to understand what complementary colors are how color is actually visible to us like how it's interacting with the nature and light so all those like there's a there's a lot more in-depth studies you can do on color and light but i don't think that's necessary to just get started out i just do it because it's interesting to me i like knowing about random things so i do about a lot of difference like learn about a lot of different stuff but to just start out i think all you need to know is the basic color theory and yeah then go out in nature and try to see like how they are implemented in nature i think nature is the best teacher you can have so just observe and yeah should be there Ritesh asks, uh, I usually draw from reference a lot. I kind of have imposter syndrome around drawing from imagination. Do you have any tips on overcoming this? Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to draw from references just because like uh, I I don't do it normally. It does not mean like you have to follow the same path. Like, it's up to you like what you feel comfortable with. And once you like that, thing about not being able to draw from imagination it's mostly related to your visual library so the more you paint the better your visual library or just not even paint you need to just observe properly if you are not painting somewhere or something and eventually your visual library would go and you will be able to be stuck from just imagination hmm. I think developing that visual library is really important and I've heard it being talked about quite a bit at uh, art conventions in lectures and in talks, the kind of the process of drawing from so many different points of reference that eventually, as you said, I and your brain is just kind of able to mesh different yeah. things together of stuff you've done before to create something entirely new. Exactly. Like just look at Kim Jong Ji and uh, no, uh, oh, all yeah. those like amazing people. Like they just uh draw fantastic stuff like everywhere it's just like so hard to imagine for us but for us they have practiced so much like for them yeah practice so much it's like a second nature to them so i think yeah that's a really important point and it it's not about you know uh, if you just put your time in it of course you need to put your time in it but it's also about like your experience like how you view a subject it changes as you grow as an artist or as a person so i guess that's there as well yeah kim jong gi is like insane i've seen a couple of his live draws pop up on instagram lately and, or live streams rather he just does uh just captures himself drawing on like walls and stuff just amazing i mean yeah it's hard to wrap your brains at all yeah <laughs> Animus would like to know, uh, how did you come up with your own style and how can one find their own style? This is a, a really common question. It's something that people are always chasing. Yeah, uh, I think it's something that you have to stop chasing in order to find it. It's not something mm. you can force. It just comes to you naturally. It's your nature. It's nothing else. Like You need to understand that style is mostly, I mean, it has something to do with your color choices uh maybe your like shape shape language and all that but all those things actually grow with you as a person and as an artist as an artist but what uh your personality really doesn't change like doesn't matter how uh how you grow old your personality stays the same maybe you improve upon your personality so that's like your style is your personality it's nothing else like it's mostly just has to do with your personal for me, I'm pretty lazy about a lot of things. Like I try to find the most efficient way to do something. And I think that's all, because I have thought about this a lot as well. Like how, how, how did I, like, you know, how do I reach there? How, how do I, you know, tell someone who asked this question, how do I answer it? So but this is the answer I have right now, that you just need to uh, get a good grasp on your basics and it generally and don't don't be afraid of you know just making mistakes make a lot of mistakes I mean that's that's the best way to learn right so make a lot of mistakes and find something that is fun to you that you really enjoy doing and where you can truly be yourself so problem it's not really a problem but uh, what I've seen is like uh, 
it's easier to get a job if you just follow certain aspects, certain styles, certain workflows. And a lot of people do that, not because they want to or whatever, they, they might be having fun doing that. But it's mostly like not a lot of people has that option to you know just do their own things their whole life because they have family to support or something along the line. It's not just always uh, you know, happy times. So uh, for those aspects, it's actually very admirable that you're you know trying to emulate something and get a job and make some sort of earning. But to find your style, I think you really need to like embrace who you are, you know, because style is uh, for me it's like from what I understand, it's just your flaws presented in a like you know uh, <laughs> a beautiful way, I suppose. So. Yeah, as I was saying, for me, I'm pretty lazy. Like I try to find the most efficient to do something. Like if I can do something with a single stroke, I'll do that. So I think that's how I generally go about developing my own style. How can I be more efficient with my brushwork? And mm. yeah, so I do studies uh, all the time. Like let's say I take a complex object, or not even complex, just a simple object, and I'm, I'm, I generally try to do it, maybe limit my strokes. And I used to do these sort of studies back in the days, but not anymore. Now I just sketch. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just put down the object and try to draw it in a certain amount of strokes. So let's say I have a cup. How can I minimize the effort I'm putting in there to render a certain object and make people still believe that it's a cup, it's a mug, it's, it's something. So people can still read it, and uh, I don't have to put out put out as much effort. So yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. It's 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 about your personality, accept who you are, and generally when painting, because digital painting has this thing, right? Like you can do pretty much anything, try out anything. You don't have that many limitations here, as you're just only limited by your imagination. You are in traditional medium. You will have to think about a lot of stuff. You, you'll have to try your canvases, you'll have to prepare, you'll have to wait for the paints to dry, in like uh, then uh, you know, random uh, flies coming in and you know, sucking up your watercolor and all that. So there's a lot of, lot of things to worry about when you're uh, doing you know, traditional medium, but you can be a bit more fearless when going into digital medium. So I like, encourage you to just exploit that and you know, do what you like and just go at it. I think that's that's the way to go about it. And don't stress too much about having a style. It takes time and, and it's, it's, again, it's different for everyone, I suppose. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it takes time, I think, is something to really stress. Like, yeah. all of the artists that you guys see online who have these incredible styles, like, I and here exactly, for example, you know, it's been years of just drawing and trying and making mistakes and getting up and trying again and trying different things. Yeah. Um, it's not something that just happens overnight. And I really love what you said, Ian, about how your style is your personality and it doesn't really change, like finding who you are and being able to put that to canvas, I think is so powerful. But yeah, it just, it takes so much time, everyone. Like don't get down on yourself. Yeah, it takes time and it takes uh, takes effort on your part as well. Like if you just like like what I did uh, from very early days of my career, I like I waste so much time. It's it's like I write uh, now. I just think about it. It's like okay, how, how, why did I do that? Like I wasted so much time. But that's also fine with me because like I even if I wasted a lot of time, I got to learn something in return yeah. maybe not art related but something else so yeah just put put in the effort and be who you are i mean don't don't never be afraid to be who you are if people don't accept it that's fine you are not living for them you're living for yourself yes preach that is excellent advice yeah cat says uh what you just said there, I am that style is just your flaws presented in a beautiful way. That is excellent. I Take should that quote. probably just yeah, write a book or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
beautiful. Um, I'm noticing here as you're painting and that you're using some really lovely vibrant greens and blues, a lot of blues and stuff. And it's something that I've noticed in your work a lot lately. Do you seem to go through phases of using certain hues for certain oh. things and then switching to new ones? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I have been in love with uh, the color blue for like last few months. I'm not using it on every painting, but yeah, I've been experimenting with a lot with it a lot because uh, I feel like blue is probably the hardest color to you know just uh, name because the value shift is huge. Something I can quickly show here. There. So here I'll just show you how value. This is a, such an important part of such an important part of uh, just color theory. That I, like I need to show it. So let's say this is, uh, I'll, I'll just keep the value at around, let's say 80%. Right? Come on, come on. Okay, 80%. All right, so we'll start with the uh, lowest saturation, and I'm here at blue, all right. So this hue is around blue, and the saturation is at 0%. So I'll put down a stroke. Take a different brush. Put on a stroke here. And then I'll start shifting the saturation a bit. I'm not changing values at all. But notice how the value range shifts. Like it's probably the most dramatic make in any than any other colors. And you can see when I turn on this layer. I have not changed the values at all. It's just the just 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 the hue, it's just the saturation of the color that's being changed, and you get all the range of values you need. So this is why blue is probably for me at least one of the hardest colors to use in a painting because every time you put some satur increase saturation, your value will shifts. So you need to think about all those things when actually putting down blue. I find it challenging mm -hmm. and I really find it fun. So uh, this is something. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah, it's really right? Cool. I mean, it's not something it's, that... It's like, a, like, it does not make much sense. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, it makes sense once you get to know the uh, like physics behind it, but it's a different story. Aren't you... That's really cool, though. I'd never actually sat down and done that myself and played with the value sliders to see what's what's happening through that hue scale that's really cool i mean that's the thing like if we are starting just with colors these are all the things that we need to keep in mind it's not just mm -hmm. you know just painting because in black and white values you can paint the values that's why i generally don't like painting in black and white because when you paint in black and white you have a certain value range and you start putting in colors here your value range will shift and you have to redo yeah. a lot of the work, so that takes a lot of time, and I I don't I don't want to waste my time. I just <laughs> so yeah, just start with colors and figure out my way out like when I need something. Okay, so here. Uh, Natasha, who followed your April plein air paintings throughout the month she says she was so inspired by the way you were able to create such beautiful images from everyday scenes and she's retracted it why did you retract it natasha that was lovely <laughs> maybe there was a spelling mistake in there uh, that's fine we are not <laughs> judging you for your karma here <laughs> but yeah plain year april was like so much fun i got to learn so much because i only had before like, uh, no, this was my first, like, uh, I think this was my first year. Yeah, I, I do plain years now and then, but it's not very committing in nature. So I'm just paint maybe once or twice a week for plain years. But this was really yeah. fun because like, even if I had work, I had still had to squeeze in time. So I could not be like, you know, spending four or five hours in a painting all the time. So I hmm. really had to nail my workflow, like how, how, how to how can I save some time here and how can I do something more quickly, more efficient? That actually helped me yeah. a lot about thinking. And as I mentioned, like I, I I'm just I'm still painting in one year. So. 
really good exercise in learning how to paint quickly, I guess. Yeah. And did you finish the entire month? Yeah, I finished everything. And nice. I also started uh, May Sketch a Day as well. For oh, now. wow. <laughs> I have not. Straight into the next one. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. That's Goodness. Do you find it really difficult to try to have to do something every day? Uh, it is very difficult for me, but I'm still trying to do it properly. See how that goes. Because, like, uh, I generally like to take it easy on myself when I feel like I'm being overwhelmed. Yeah. But this is also something that I enjoy doing. So I need to find a like balance. Maybe I'll keep doing this for now. Let's see how that goes. You can see everything. Like you can figure out how it works out later on. Hello, Leafy Lavender. If you've just turned up in the chat, we are watching Ian do a couple paintings here. So we're working on the top one currently, I think. I hope there's not a, too much of a delay with the stream. Yeah. Yeah, I just started working on the second piece. Really uh, Do you use traditional media at all or are you purely digital? I used to do a lot of watercolors and wash. Mm, never really oh, got nice. into acrylic or oil. I really want to try it. Yeah, it's, you know, the work schedule and everything. Then when I have free time, I'll just be, you know, doing my own thing. So it's hard for me to get back to traditional now. But I used to do a lot of particulars and wash back. And that was really fun. <laughs> Maybe like soon, once I have my studio set up here, then probably I'll get back to it. Hmm. And when you're going to like digital and stuff, do you find that you gravitate towards the same style of brushes and tools digitally as you enjoy using traditionally? Uh, yeah, they are like very really efficient in nature. Like I generally, if I, as I told you, if I have to put, uh, if I can put down a stroke and make it seem like, let's say if I want it uh, human, that probably just means this. People can probably guess like it's someone standing there. So like this. Maybe one and two. So you know there's a human there, so I don't need to put much effort there. So I try to yeah. do the same thing with uh, traditional medium as well. And in traditional medium, I mostly did plain airs. So it's even more important that you need everything as quickly and as efficiently as you can because the light just changes. You're just done. So <laughs> Some general amazement in the comments. <laughs> I mean, these are not even that good. I, 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 what can I do here? Maybe. Oh, sorry, I think your mic might be a bit far away. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay, okay. No, I'm still wondering if I keep the sky blue or just paint it all over. Hmm, not bad. Oh. <laughs> but maybe a bit too much. But yeah, that's the thing with the single layer approach. I mean, I can just do this. And now I can create a layer and keep it as a separate option. Hmm. Going back to when you were discussing um, the different values within the same hue range and all of that, hmm. uh, who is it in the chat here? Karat wants to know, what's the easiest way to fix your values if you do mess them up? So there's something called value grouping that you should be doing a lot because ideally you want to group values if you have a like a real picture would have a lot more values than you can uh like perceive like not perceive but uh you can see a lot of different values stuck, uh, sticking together in a good painting you generally want to keep the values group what i mean by that is let's say like usually this road here okay like it's not in sync but the sort of the road just, just keep new layer. 
the road here has a, like just a single value structure here but usually when you uh, go out and see a road you'll see a lot of value shifts within them because there will be some sort of reflection some sort of shadows creating there but if we try to emulate that as precisely as nature then what ends up happening is like you create a lot of like small details here and there that will distract the viewer a lot so usually for big shapes you usually try to just keep the values contained into a singular value rather than going really by value shapes i mean you add textures you add you know uh, different uh, frequencies in there and that messes up the uh, visual harmony that we try to create in a uh, painting so usually just try to keep your values grouped properly like here's a bush like there's a bush here so bushes generally have a lot of different values and a lot of different hues in them but if they're far away you can simplify them and keep them under a uh, same value group and that way it will still beat but uh, it's not it will not be as distracting even when you're working uh, some on something that's uh, let's say that's very realistic in nature even then you want to follow this rule because uh, th that's the difference between taking a photo and painting something or creating something because we try to harmonize everything we take the best parts from nature and try to emphasize the the best parts so we try to make the viewers see what we intend them to see so I, uh, that's how you should be thinking about values if you see your value structures is not working and you see something is wrong uh, then just try to think about how you have grouped your values if, if the contrast is too much or like if the contrast is faced out all over the image so a lot of things like these are uh, very difficult topics to cover in a like, single answer but yeah i think that's the uh, main gist how i try to troubleshoot my value issues yeah and everyone watching um ian actually has a course on understanding and applying design principles as well on his website there's a link in the uh the caption for the video if you wanted some more classes from him and do you plan on doing more tutorials and more classes because this is i've learned so much already i actually have some plans but that's the thing i'll probably have to move back to home soon like i am already here but i have to move back here permanently because mm -hmm. like it, it's been a while in Bangalore and I'm bored, so I'd rather be sitting here and maybe doing something. So I need to set up my studio first, which I which is still like it's not on the way because of COVID and all that. So we'll yeah. see like when that happens because I need a proper setup to record all the stuff and you know plan everything. So I'll probably start planning now, and I have some plans of mentorships later this year. Oh, uh, nice and maybe some small tutorials along the way. Oh, that'll be really cool. <laughs> Angelo would like to know, um, oh, I first of all didn't know, were you a Photoshop user originally, Ian? Yep. Yeah, okay, so Angelo would like to know, what was it like moving from Photoshop to Procreate? How long did it take for you to get fully accustomed and comfortable? Mm. And do you have any tips for making that switch? So for me, uh, I just started using uh, Procreate because that was the reason I bought an iPad. I had no other use of uh, like of having an iPad. So I saw some threads paint in it and I tried it and I said, okay, this is it. I need this. So I just saved up some money and just bought it. And when, like, as soon as I jumped in, I felt so, like, you know, in tune with the canvas, that's, like, hard to achieve. Because I, I, I think I've said this before as well. I, I tried the, uh, the, you know, the normal canvases that you get, like the normal canvas tablets that you get, what do you call it, Cintiqs and everything. Mm. So Cintiqs generally have this like sort of lag i tried it a couple of times but they still have that that really felt like uncomfortable for me but when i tried the ipad and it that just like worked like a charm and, and i i was really happy painting in it that's that's the thing i want to see 
and usually to learn the basics back when i started group it still uh, was a bit simple now a lot of features are in it which is a great thing but maybe a bit overwhelming for newer audiences so don't focus on those just try to focus on uh, what you want to do with the software like any software if you want to learn something just focus on the base very basics first and then try to uh, just uh, learn those and as long as you keep using them it takes about a week or two to just like get accustomed to the software and as you keep using it you'll uh, like keep learning more and more about it and you'll get more efficient at it so yeah <gasps> can be a little bit intimidating as well i think procreate is uh, deceptively powerful yeah um, yeah that's what right. a lot of things hidden so <laughs> There's so many stuff like a lot. Uh, lately, I found this one: the how to copy and cut and paste with uh, this thing, this shortcut here. Like where you can oh, just, yeah. uh, three finger <laughs> down. Yeah, it's really helpful. Then I found out about this thing from a tutorial you guys posted a couple of not even not even weeks, like maybe a week back, where you can just switch your brush to your uh, brush or eraser to your current tool. Which is really helpful. Oh yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> just this and done. Uh, so good. It sounds like you've been watching our IGTV videos. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> lot of, so many small stuff hidden in there. I don't know how to like you know understand all of this. But, yeah. yeah. I don't think I even remember half of the stuff that it can do. Honestly, <laughs> come back to it. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I could do that. We have a question here about uh, learning as well. So you mentioned at the start of the stream that you're a self-taught, um, mm. and there's so many, you know, there's so many resources online. You can do this yourself. Mm. Do you have any recommended learning sources that you would tell people to go and try? It depends on what you're trying to achieve. To be honest, it's not just mm. one answer because uh, I I don't have a like curated list for you guys that you want to pick up and you know be good at art instantly because that's not possible firstly but some books i generally recommend is uh james gundy's color and light uh, that's just like phenomenal book you, like if you're any sort of art any sort of an artist you should definitely pick that up and uh, that's that's actually the only book i can remember reading properly i have a lot of like different books but i generally don't go back to them all that time all that much but when uh, this book, I just like keep reopening every couple of months and I learn something new about like new colors in general. So it's like so good. Yeah, nice. I'll have to check that one out. I have to Google for it now myself. Oh, <laughs> ah, yeah, just type it out for the chat. Maybe also. It's really good. I mean, it's really popular as well and for good reasons. Oh, yeah, I've seen this cover before, actually. Yeah, a dino Yeah. Play. Just put the link in the chat for anyone who's interested in checking out that book that I just recommended. It's a really great book. It's not. It's not even that uh, costly, and it has a lifetime Hi. lifetime worth of uh, informations. That's yeah. That's exactly the thing, right? Like, you can spend all this money going to school, but really, there is so much information and so much learning available online for such little cost. Exactly. And this is not at all at all dissing people who do make the choice to go to art school. There are definitely valuable things you can get from a formal education. But um, if it's unaccessible to you, don't be disheartened. You can still do art with all of the stuff that's available online. Yeah, honestly, uh, like when I was starting out, I just found out about Art Center and I looked up the fees. I'll probably have to like sell the whole area and maybe more to just like, you know, get the fees out gosh yeah it's so like it's ridiculously costly especially for us people like us like in india 
it just like mm. seems absurd i mean why would anyone want to spend that much money for just study purposes anyway with that said that is probably <laughs> the best skill with school you can get into but yeah even if you don't get into it that's fine you don't need it oh nice question here on composition um how do you go about i guess figuring that out how do you improve your composition Hmm. So my whole tutorial is about this because composition is not a single subject. Composition mm. is the culmination and adding, multiplying all the fundamentals aspect you have in painting and designing, and then coming together, like it all comes together into composition. Like composition is about the finished image. It's not the sketches, not anything. So once you finish the image your final image that's your final composition so how like it it, it, it all improves uh, as you improve your fundamentals and it adds up it it multiplies so but general rule of thumbs for planning like not i used to mistake a lot this with just composition in general but planning your composition it's different like what i'm doing here is mostly planning my composition because it's a short time and uh, I, I don't have time to just like, you know, finish the whole thing right away. So I'm trying to do a sketch where I can see the color, I can see the like general comp, how it, it can be in the final image. But final comp would still be slightly different, maybe very close to it, but uh, it will still be different. And that actually will change over, depending on how much you know about your fundamentals. Yeah, I think I think that's about it. It's not a single thing. It's just it's a, a combination of all the basic principles. Hmm. And you mentioned just before that your your composition is it's that's your composition when you finish. That's it. Yeah. How do you know? This is a question from the chat earlier. How do you know when your work is finished? Mm, intuition, mostly. <laughs> Yeah, because like uh, I I don't work on photorealistic stuff. I I did studies back in the days. I was like, okay, why why would I do this? I'd rather just take a photo and be done with it. So mm. I never really yeah. found an interest in that. So as long as I am happy with it, even then it's not finished. I know there's always more to be done, and that's how I generally end up ruining an image. So <laughs> when I have a good composition going, I'll just, you know, uh, keep working on it as to, okay, maybe if I can do this here, do that there. And suddenly your composition is all, like it's gone. And then they look at what happened. So to avoid that, what I do is I don't work uh, continuously on a single image. So. Right. Let's say I, I'll spend maybe two, three hours for the sketch and maybe I like it then, but I need a fresh perspective to just uh, really know that uh, this is working. So I'll just take a short break or maybe, maybe just leave it for the day. And when I come back to it, I'll have a different perspective on the image because I would have forgotten most of it. And also when you go away from something you don't really forget about it it's still stuck in your mind like you're still trying to figure out the problems uh, you had there so you'll also come up with different solution when you uh, do that and that's that's why i generally try to take a lot of breaks in between uh, maybe sleep mm. sleep a bit maybe sleep a bit uh, maybe just go out go for a run or just like you know sit down watch something doesn't matter and after I've come back, I'll have a better idea where, where to improve. And if I do really need to improve on something, and if I don't need to improve something, everything is readable, everything looks good to me, then I'll just call it done. And once I'm done with an image, I don't generally just touch them. So yeah. Yeah. And that kind of need to have fresh eyes and to work on different things at once, is that part of the reason you split your canvas like this and paint two different images at the same time? Oh yeah, not even two different. I'll just show you something cool. I like it, it's cool to me. I'm not sure like if you like it or not. So. 
So what I generally do is this. I'll divide the canvas into 16 equal portions. And I'll start painting. So can you see the canvas? I'm not sure how deep the stream is. What's up, Yeah, I think it's oh, I think we're, oh yeah, there we go. So yeah, I'll have like these sort of frames uh, divided. I just feed this boundary. A lot oh, of wow. the times without the boundary, it would not even make sense. I will show you the other one. So here, if I just take off the boundary, it does not even make sense. Most of these, like what are these? But when I put in the boundaries, you can see certain shades. Like a lot of these are not uh, as polished as the previous one, but you can still see some colors and still see some ideas here and there. And that actually helps me uh, keep a like, you know, fresh mind because if I feel like I'm stuck in a single oh. image, what I can do is, let's say I don't like this part, so I'll just maybe do something, random scribbles and trying to find different shapes, different colors. And if I feel like this is not working, then I can just move to a different piece altogether. I don't need to be stuck. I don't need to be single minded about it. I can just yeah. just take this and maybe start here, maybe start here, or maybe being this. It's, it's so much freeing and it just helps me keep my mind more focused, not just, you know, tunnel visioning in a single thing. So yeah, this is something I really like to oh, I forgot I need to finish the other sketch. Wow. This is so cool to see. And I think a, pers a perfect example of why your hues are so important, why your values are so important, because these thumbnails are so small on my screen, but all of them are readable. I can see exactly what each of the thumbnails is showcasing there. Yeah, that's a these are beautiful the way we should be like, you know, at least I like to plan my stuff around because uh, when you zoom out, like when you look at look at an image from really far away, you don't see all the details. And that's the beauty mm -hmm. I like about it. Like you can read certain shapes. Uh, you can uh, you can read certain patterns and your mind will tell you this is this, this is that. So make your viewers work for the meal, not just, you know, give it to them straight. Like, you know, don't don't uh, explain everything. Leave room for some interpretation and that makes the image all the more interesting. Yeah. Maybe I can use some light here. Let's see. Jaito in the comments would like to know, uh, what is the usual common mistake that beginners make when it comes to digital painting or concept art? Focusing on details. <clears throat> I yeah. have done that and I see a lot of people doing that as well. We just keep on like, you know, over rendering objects which don't need rendering that much. And you just keep getting stuck on the same space because you're not moving on, you're not doing the things that needs to be done. Yeah, just like let's say I go into this building and I start painting over it. Like, okay, there is something, it's maybe a building, maybe some sort of structure. There are windows here, something like that. But it, you don't need to do all of that stuff like right away. You can figure out the details. And to figure out details, I generally, that's the moment when I uh, look for references. Because I know what is that, I have a basic idea. So I, I, I just don't know the details of it. Like, I don't know how to like, you know, add more details to it or something. Then I can like, uh, go look for objects, go look for references, and then I can do all the detailing I need, but focusing on your details way too early generally is a very good way to mess up your image. And I generally try not to do that anymore.
I'm just getting totally lost in watching this happen on screen. This is incredible. I, I'm actually glad, like, you know, I was able to do something. I, I was a bit nervous when just starting. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. That's, that's how life works, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> totally fine. have a look at my my list of questions that have popped up here. I should actually do my job and not just sit here and watch and paint. Um, <laughs> ah, I have another question from Procreate HQ, actually. This one is, what advantages and what limitations does digital art bring to your practice? Uh, the advantage is there's no limit to what I can try out on the canvas while in traditional mm -hmm. I'll have to be very limited like I need to pin down an idea need to know like okay this is it this is what I'm going to paint but in digital medium I don't have to worry about all that and it's really past I mean just imagine doing something akin to the first painting what I've done here in a canvas you'll need to plan and this is the only thing you can do here but here, if I wanted to change the house, I could just do it in within minutes, like something like this. It's maybe make it bigger. But in a canvas, that's not possible. So, like this is the beauty of digital painting, and I have not really. Okay, so uh, there's a small thing that I actually don't like about digital painting, which can't be helped, at least now, is the dynamic of the brush brush strokes like when you paint with a real brush you get textures that are unique each time you put your brushes down that is not mm -hmm. the case with uh, digital painting so every time you have a stamp like the brushes are basically that you have a stamp you have some sort of textures in them and you paint with them so it uh, it doesn't matter how what settings you play with the uh, results will still be somewhat predictable and not random so this is something i've been trying to create with the brushes but it's still very structural and not as fluid as you know a uh, traditional medium so that's something i sort of miss uh, like from the traditional medium otherwise digital is just fantastic i mean <laughs> so much stuff you can do here it's it's it's, it's wondrous I think it does open up a lot of ability to just kind of create without stress, without worry. Exactly. Because um, you're not wasting paper or wasting a canvas. If you muck up, you can just yeah. two finger tap or <laughs> just delete the entire thing from your gallery and you're good to go. Exactly. You don't even need to delete anything. You just paint on top of it. No. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. This is, this is another thing I do to like find out ideas. So we'll, we'll just go back and quickly show. Like I have a lot of different ways to go about ideas, uh, but this is one of them. So let's see, like I I want to start a new sketch, but I'm stuck on ideas. So what I'll do is I maybe pick one of my old paintings or just sketches and maybe we'll go to the thumbnails here as well. So let's say I like certain aspect of certain images. I'll just pick that and start drawing over it. Let's say I make a new layer for this. So let's say I like this color palette here, like the green, yellow, and teal, and all that. I want something to be done in similar palette, but I want something different from what I have here. So. I'll just quickly start painting over this. This guy here. And since it's really small, I don't have to worry about all the, I can just pick out the colors that I need from here. And then after I have something, I'll, why, why, why? Yes. So, Mm -hmm. 
So this is the part where I actually focus way more than when I'm actually just painting uh, something that I have already decided on. Like when I have something con concrete, I'll just like, you know, go in and paint. That's very mindless for me. And that's, that's fun in, in its own way. But like, that's the time when I can talk, talk more during painting. But like when ideation, I generally, it's very difficult for me to speak. Uh, as I just try to create ideas. But yeah, generally now I have something I can just play around with colors more. Maybe add some violet in there, see how that looks. And then I have some randomizer like brushes here, which are like really good for you know, filling up scenes like these. And since they're very small, you get to make like big changes and very short while. So, and they're very abstract still. But that's that's what I generally do. I just play around with abstract shapes. And when I see some shapes in them, I was like, okay, that's it. That that's the idea I was looking for, or that's the idea I like. So I'll just start start taking it to a little more finished stage where I can just, you know, people can understand it. Before that, it's mm -hmm. just like random shapes. So maybe I can see some structure, some downs, maybe some reflection on the ground. So at that time, I'll just go in and start to make, start making it more readable to people who are not me. <laughs> Because that's the, that's the thing, it's like uh, cloud watching where you just watch clouds and try to find different shapes in them. And every people, yeah. like, everyone will try, uh, everyone will find like different shapes in a singular, like in a, in a single image. And that's the beauty of it. So I, I see something, but other people might not see that. So this time, what I try to do is to flesh out the stuff I'm seeing. and make it more believable for the viewer. I really like that. It's like cloud watching. It's excellent. Yeah, and you have so much freedom in there as well. I mean, you can change the whole scene in just like you know, a couple of seconds. Just no pressure, mm -hmm. nothing, just painting. So Dip would like to know, how much time do you spend on each drawing on average? Honestly, two hours, three hours. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, most of my paintings nowadays are like this. So it's very rough. Then this was done in like about five minutes. And then I'll mm -hmm. take this and maybe spend another hour or something on it. And that's wow. because I've been doing the daily sketches recently, right? So. Uh, it's 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 hard to accommodate more than a couple of hours to each paintings, and when yeah. I really like something, then I will probably take some more time, maybe just you know, keep working on it when I have time, and I guess that's it. But main thing is, I generally try to spend a lot of time thinking about the painting rather than painting it all the time. It's, I don't know, it works for me. Yeah. Um, because that's the thing, it's, it's been a fascination of me since like the longest time that I, I like the idea of uh, subconscious mind a lot, like how it does a lot of work that we are not even aware on a daily basis. And I try to like, you know, put it to good use rather than just thinking of, of like random ideas, depressing ideas, negative thoughts. I just ask my like, you know, mind with like other, other, other ideas that, okay, I have this problem to solve. I'll just tell myself that. And when I'm not doing anything or just my, my mind just wanders off. I, I, so I'll still be thinking about it somewhere. And hopefully when I come back to a painting, I'll have some answers. Mm. And that's really fun for me. Yeah. 
Okay, I completely got off track here and started painting something else altogether. That is totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just enjoying the process. Yeah. Okay, so it's, I mean, it's still readable here, I guess. Mm, Ritesh has a question for either one of us, I am, but mm. do you, you're probably really equipped to answer it, do you do a lot of printing of your work? Not really as of now. I, I have a print shop on imprint, but that's about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't really update it all that much. Maybe I should start doing that properly. It's just every time I think about uh, doing something, you know, like uploading prints and all that, I'm like, okay, let's do it tomorrow. Let's paint something or let's go <laughs> watch something else. And I keep delaying it and yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. But I used to do a lot of printing back when I was uh, doing the all the conventions and all that. So I print and carry all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, it was fun, but also not fun. It's very stress stressful. <laughs> <laughs> on that then, do you have any tips on getting a good print out of your painting? Because Ritesh is finding that their prints just don't turn out so well. So that has a lot to do with your uh, artworks as well as the printer you're going to because a lot of the printers can't actually produce the quality of color that you need in a painting because the, the printers really don't have like uh, those printers were not made for this purpose they, they had a different purpose it's more generalized not specialized but uh, something that might help you with your printing is generally keeping your dark values not so dark like generally don't go below like you know uh, eight percent or something like that six to eight percent mm. never go like full black because in print if you uh, put this down and maybe you put like zero percent black and maybe five percent black this different won't be visible in the print so don't go too dark when you're just printing stuff out. So that's that's the general thing. It's... Okay, okay, I'm, I'm done with this one. I just go back to the other one. Okay, where was it? I need to organize my stuff better. Kat, that's a good question. DPI always stumps a lot of people. So Kat asks, what DPI should you be using if you might want to print the work later? Oh, oh that, um, that I'm not very clear about it myself. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I, a very... Yeah, go on, go on. Sorry, go no, ahead. No, 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 go on. I don't have anything much to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I have a very rudimentary understanding of DPI. Um, Firstly, I would like to disclose that uh, that you should always, I think, talk to your printer because they will be able to give you uh, custom advice as to what you're doing with your your prints. 
But for DPI, generally, um, the smaller the physical print is going to be, the more uh, the more saturated your DPI should be. So the bigger the DPI should be, because if it's really small, that means that someone is going to be pretty up close to it looking at it. So you want that colour to be really, really uh, nicely kind of like coated on the piece. But if you're doing a really big print, people are going to be standing a bit further back so you can afford to have less DPI. So if you're printing something, say, A4 or magazine page size, you should really go around 300 DPI. Um, and if you go all the way up to like giant billboard size, I think billboards are around 15 DPI. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case because people aren't going to be super close to it. So you don't need to have the really compact DPI. Um, and then you've kind of got all your ranges in between that, which will vary with DPI. So generally rule of thumb is the smaller the physical print, the larger, the higher the DPI should be and the bigger it is, the less the DPI should be. But as I said, please check with your printer because they'll be able to give you totally correct, customized advice on what you're doing. That is fascinating. I hope that answers the question, Kat. <laughs> oh my God. And Ritesh, do you recommend any printers or print services? Um, that's really dependent on you. We've seen so many good artists doing their own prints. Uh, so many people using services like Inprint. Like Ian said that he's got his own shop on Inprint. Mm. Um, Inprint has really my nice very, quality. Like, yeah. <laughs> they really do. My personal experience buying art prints from Inprint has been really good. The quality is awesome. The paper is really lovely. The colors come out perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, really up to you. But one issue I have had with imprint is like if you have uh, pieces that are really dark, like really mm. subtle uh, value shifts, so maybe brighten them up a bit before sending it to them. Yeah, top tip. Mm. Everything with Ari asks, what are your favorite brushes to use? Do you have any favorites out of your own pack? Mm, okay, so I mostly paint with very few brushes, so which are still here. Like I use these few brushes quite a lot from like the regular round till here. My favorite one is this one. I have a recent new favorite, which I'll show. I am still like experimenting with the brush, so I'm not sure like how that fits in, but I really like it till now. It's just a variation of a previous brush I had. So this one I like really a lot because you get such nice colors out of it, like let's say this, but you can also, if you just ease, ease on the pressure, you can just paint normally. If you put more pressure, there's a lot of color jitter happening. So I like this one. I've been liking this one recently and I love this one. So this creates a randomized sort of painterly texture. Okay, right. Something like this. But you can't really oh, paint nice. it with like, you know, uh, it's not for precision. It's more chaos based. So you try to tame it, but like, you, know, you fail and you try again. It's really hard to control, but it's also giving such nice textures that you usually, I usually just like tap and create different shapes every time I tap. It's really nice. It's one of my personal favorites here and right. Okay. I really like the wet oil one as well. It's got that. Uh, oil texture feel to it that I don't really get anywhere else. That is so cool. Yeah, blends in really nicely. And I generally use this to mostly paint skies or to make, you know, distant objects because it has that uh, 
like very traditional feel to it and it gives it that yeah. nice texture so i generally use it for that and anything else i also like this one this is a bit tricky to use it's a like sharp and uh, smooth brush like one edge i call it so it has uh, one side is sharp other side is smooth so you can really create a lot of stuff with it like depending on how you use the brushes you can let's say like this tree needs some volume so i'll just pick the colors here and and you get these sort of things like quick volumes and oh cool yeah so like uh it's it's a great way to show volumes in random objects and you don't need to do much work as i, as I told you i'm always looking for ways to just you know, <laughs> not do much work I think yeah that's these are all for now. I also like this much brush. Mm, this one. So this also gives out that nice veiny texture. Like, this looks really nice if, if you apply it properly. And if you add a sharpen filter on top, it's just so good. Okay, that's about it. I'll just go back to this. Let's see. Carrot, is there a way to turn off color blending on the brushes? There is so many options in the brush studio and procreate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so many options. Uh, there's, it's a little bit difficult to get exactly what you're after uh, through the chat on YouTube. But if you wanted some help with some customized brush settings, please feel free to reach out to us at support. We will be totally happy to help you find your perfect brush settings. So you can hit us up at um, www.procreate.art forward slash support, and we'll be able to help you out there. Probably the easiest way to help you out on a stream like this. Yeah, you can also play around with the settings, which I actually did because uh, I did not watch the tutorials before I figured out most of the stuff. Then I watched the mm. tutorial and I was like, okay, why did I waste my time? So just just, just go and watch <laughs> the tutorial first, so you'll have a better idea of how everything works. Yeah, it's really nice to lay down volumes with this one. You can just do random stuff and read as volume. And yeah, at this point, I'll just add a human being standing somewhere and be like, okay, I'm done. I'm done for the day. It's not a human. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll give you the stick salesman. Nice.
Wait, are you still in the call? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, so, I am still on the call. I got distracted again just watching. I'm I'm terrible at this job. No, no, I, I thought I got disconnected. Like it has happened to me no. before. Uh, like I was streaming for almost two hours. I got like you know disconnected somewhere in between. I did not even realize. You know what? Where is everyone? Ah, uh, I mean, with Australia's bad internet, I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen. But I no, mean, it hasn't happened. My internet is not that good either, so. <laughs> uh, animation, animated motion pencil studios. Iron is using his animate uh, his animation. I'm reading the name again. His imagination for this one. Imagination. Hmm. His internal visual library. So yeah, at this point, I have a clear idea of which way I want to go. Now, I'll if I really want to take one of these to finish. So what I'll do is I'll gather up some references and from even the references, I don't generally try to copy everything I see. I generally try to take out the like the planar studies we have seen so far. I'll generally try to take the best parts of the certain feature. Let's say like I, I have a cloud somewhere here. Like there are generally cumulonimbus clouds that will hover very low into the atmosphere and they'll be very dark. So I really like those and I can probably implement those and like these, something like that. And if I have a reference, I could find out like which should work best here and I can take the best parts from there and add those features into my painting. And but that's how I generally use reference. It's not just, mm. you know, uh, how, not, like I mean, small, smaller details as well. But generally, these uh, these are the things you can look for good stuff in certain images, and then try to bring it to my own painting. I also take reference from this thing, master paintings, when finishing in painting once in a while. It's really like refreshing because. The more you watch those paintings, the more you realize how worthless you are. It's like, I mean, it's it's a good feeling, it's a bad feeling altogether. Like it's inspiring and it's also depressing a bit. But once you try to like, once you uh, dissect those paintings, you can learn so much. I just always try to figure out like uh, how to how the masters did it, and they like. Nowadays, we are living in a, such a fast-paced world. Like, it's, like, I'm probably the prime example. I finish a painting within like four or five hours and be done with it, never see that again. And masters used to paint a picture for like same picture for years, like two, three years, like mm. at least months, even, even if it's, it's not years. 
and that's like that sort of patience I, I, I can only imagine and hopefully I'll get there someday let's see yeah my my work in progress folder is filled with stuff that I spend like 15 minutes on and I'm like yeah cool alright next thing <laughs> I just I don't have the attention span for it. It's terrible. But to yeah. think, yeah, like months to years on the single painting. Yeah, it's just incredible. Like, so inspiring as well. We've been streaming for two hours. How are you feeling, Ian? Uh, pretty good. Maybe I need some more tea. Oh, I have tea. the guy got it. I don't know. Maybe it's a bit Animesh is struggling with their paintings always looking flat, even if they've used textured brushes to paint. Do you have any uh, tips on how to overcome that problem and giving your work a bit more depth and volume? Textured brushes will do you more harm than actual good if you don't create depth uh, without using values. So how mm -hmm. I see values generally is so the darkest portions of your painting should be up front and the farther you get the like lighter your values would get and lighter the value differences would get i know i'm not exactly following that because like i've been doing this for a while and i know where to break the rule and where to keep the rule to make it like keep it believable so first thing you want to do is just uh, learn like uh, learn about atmospheric perspective which is i'll just explain it shortly so you have a good grasp of it atmospheric perspective is basically whenever you, an object fades into a distance they lose their saturation and they lose their value so if i have a very saturated uh, let's say red here not this much uh, here it will not look as good because it's not gonna go with the color palette but still if i have this much saturation here if it goes farther back it will lose most of its saturation and if it's there what, what, what? so it will be something like that like it will lose a lot of saturation and a lot of the value it looks something like that. So these are some things that you need to understand before actually uh, creating. Like that's the key to depth. You you need to understand how atmosphere works and how how it affects our uh, environment is uh, when the light is traveling to your eyes. The light is traveling through a lot of atmosphere, it gets distorted, it gets uh, refracted a lot by the dust particles and other particles in, that will present in our atmosphere. atmosphere. And uh, so when we see objects that are very far away, so they are generally the details are, will be lost there won't be as much details in color in values and details in general so you will not be able to see uh like let's say there's a building here you'll not be able to see all the building like all the uh if the building had uh, let's say windows you will not be able to see what the 
contents inside the windows where we'll be able to just identify a general shape of it. So that's generally uh, a atmospheric perspective and you can use that in a painting to just uh, guide your viewer around. You can break the rules a lot once you understand the basics. So I, I highly suggest you look into what that is. Okay, just give me two minutes and be back. I think someone was sure. knock knocking at my door. I don't know why. Oh. <laughs> People don't really visit me. Any more questions in the chat, guys? I'm sure when that slight delay catches up, they will type some stuff. Hmm. Because I'm getting restless now, I need to just get up and maybe jump around a bit or something. <laughs> That's okay. We have been streaming for two hours, so um, uh. we could probably end it around here. Yeah. Um, so any last minute questions, guys, send them through in the chat. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up within the next couple minutes so that Ian can go and jump around a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Sovic wants to know what's the best resources to get started for a complete noob. Hmm. Uh, I'd actually, for that, I'd actually recommend a lot uh, Proko's channel on YouTube. Proko Control, oh, yeah. Control Paint. Like, uh, that's that's how I got started as well. I watched the very basic tutorials in digital painting. Because when I started out, uh, like, they were probably the only channels that actually talked about art back then and at least that i could find nowadays there's mm. like uh, information everywhere so you could find probably more but uh, i watched a lot of propos videos i watched a lot of control paint a lot of uh, i forgot the other channels things but yeah those should be good enough to get you started and i believe they have some paid plans as well but their free videos are just enough. If you still want to learn more, you can just like take the paid ones, subscriptions or whatever they have. But they're really worth it. I mean, and uh, once you like cross that very beginner level, I highly recommend Schoolism. Schoolism has such great like uh, curation of courses and ev every one, like every one of those courses are taught by amazing professionals, like legends, literal legends there. So, I, I learned a lot from schoolism courses as well. And whenever I have time, I generally try to take some sort of courses, and generally try to learn something new. The, I think that keeps it fresh for me as well. And mm. because if I keep doing the same thing over and over again, I get bored very easily. And it's 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 unreal how easily I get bored, and my mind starts wandering off. So. I had to find different ways to like keep my mind occupied. Even when I'm painting something, I'll be maybe my 50, 60% attention would be towards the painting and the rest of my mind would be just wandering around, thinking about something like just the most random stuff you can find. My mind will be mm. thinking about that. So I always needed to find something and that, that has helped me. So I, that's the thing that back to the question, if you, 
I think Roku or like Control Pain, those channels, a lot more channels are there right now. But uh, those are a good place to start. And as you progress, I highly recommend schools and courses. They are phenomenal. Just, just so much information in there. I took a couple of, uh, I keep forgetting people's things. Uh, okay, if I, I'll tell you the name if I remember. Uh, anyway, so I, I took like at least five, six classes over there. And that has really helped me a lot. Yeah, cool. I haven't tried any of school business courses myself, but I hear fantastic things. And Proco, I think, has such a valuable uh, library of content on his YouTube channel. It's a really good place to start. Yeah. And uh, to top it off with everything, schoolism courses are so cheap. Like, it's it's very affordable. You don't need to get the credit yeah. once because I think that's for more advanced uh, students. Like, if they want their portfolios to be reviewed, or unless you have a lot of money, you can go for it. I have no complaints. But generally, the normal subscription will do, and uh, they are they're very cheap. They're very, I don't know the exact price, but they're very cheap. So you can just uh, try it once and see if you like it or not, and then just move from there. I don't like this thing when you get rid of it. Cool. We might uh, look to wrapping it up there then, I guess. Um, and you can go jump around, Aaron, yeah, I, get I, that I, restlessness I, out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be on it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. We'll wrap it up there then, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. I do apologize again for the technical issues that we had with our Zoom call dropping out, but thanks for sticking with us. I hope you learned something valuable here. I know that I sure did. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. It was a pleasure to watch you paint. It was such a pleasure talking to everyone here as well. I mean, I'm not very good at it yet, but I, I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> you did perfectly. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Uh, once more again, guys, you can find Ion's work on Instagram at Art of Ion. You can find his brushes and courses on his website. There is a link in the caption. And uh, this course, well, this live stream, rather, this live draw will be made available again, probably next month for you to watch over if you missed anything or if you came in late. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you all again soon. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>